So, Sophie Howlett, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Pleasure. We are going to be discussing a book, uh, Marsilio Ficino and His World, um, which was published in 2016 by Palgrave Macmillan. And as people are going to be, um, probably imagine, we're going to be discussing the, the work of Ficino, uh, Platonism, probably dip into a little bit of Hermeticism and the Hermetica, and also really the, the thought in Ficino's time. Um, and this very peculiar polymath character who there is very much being a Ficino renaissance at the moment um, and a lot of people so many people have been asking for this episode and it's been a struggle to find someone despite the fact so many people are going on about Ficino at the moment so yeah I'm very happy that you're you're here um, so yeah just tell us a little bit about yourself um, uh, what it is you do and how how this book on Ficino came about so um, presently, um, I am a professor of Renaissance philosophy. I work in that field, but my main day job is president of a university in uh, Vermont, but it's an international university. So we actually work in 50 different countries. So that's been keeping my, my hands full, so to speak, um, especially during the COVID crisis, as you can imagine, trying to run um, international higher education. Um, so in my spare time, my happy place is continuing with the Renaissance philosophy. So um, the book on Marsilio Ficino, to which you're referring, was always envisaged as number one of a series of three that would essentially lay out a little bit of a marker on some of my interests with uh, Renaissance philosophy. Um, so the second book came in 2020 on Giovanni Pico del Mirandola. And I'm working right now on the third book of the series, which is actually on Giordano Bruno. Um, and the idea, um, so yes, I, I'm happy to come back and talk about those <laughs> subjects too. Um, and actually, when you asked me to come and talk about Ficino, I actually had to go back and reread the book this weekend because I, I was my head's been in Bruno and before that Pico. So it was very useful for me. Um, the idea of the of this kind of like broad scale trilogy was first of all to find a way of bringing some of these key thinkers of the Renaissance's thought to a wider audience. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that it's beach reading, um, but it is hopefully the type of introduction and a really kind of broad but scholarly base. Um, introduction to Pacino, Pico, and, and now Bruno. So the ideas that are discussed are, are not easy. Um, the notes, I hope, are, are fully there. You have all your Latin is present, but it's in the footnotes. And I've really tried to focus on portraying these people's ideas in a way that, that um, hopefully a generalist or somebody who's interested in the field or philosophy is going to be able to pick up um, and at least explore further. Now, how did I get into Ficino? Well, that, that is an interesting question. I actually originally come from the field of literature. Um, that's my home discipline. Um, and I was, I, I guess I always wanted to be, first of all, Indiana Jones. I always saw that my career was going to be in um, Near Eastern archeology. span um, and somehow or other, I ended up doing a degree in literature, which was rather further away from those time zones. Um, and um, I was happily thinking of a career in 11th and 12th century literature and ideas. I was always interested in that interconnection. And then right at the last minute, uh, one of my professors, who is an extraordinary um, professor of uh, Renaissance literature um, at Cambridge, John Kerrigan, I'm giving him a name check here because he was very formative for me, um, gave me one of Francis Yates' books and said, I think you're going to be interested, go read this. Um, and it was actually, I think, her last book, The Occult Philosophy in the Elizabethan Age. And I was so angry reading this book because I felt she got it so wrong that I decided that I was going to write my doctorate on why she was wrong. Mm -hmm. um and um and i don't i don't mean that you know all her theories were wrong but the way that she was taking philosophy and um the figures around this set of ideas 
and then simply trying to equate them sort of, you know, as if it was apples to apples with, um, with you know, uh, people in drama like, you know, King Lear or something, you know, as a literature person, that made me really mad. And it mm. felt that it was a good moment for, for me as somebody who always wants to look at where the ideas in literature came from to somehow rectify that situation. Now, I, I will say to anybody who's listening out there, that is not a good reason for doing a doctorate. So don't, don't do that. Um, a you know, because, out of spite. It, well, it wasn't spite, but it was more like a reaction because mm. then you're from a negative. So, you know, but gradually, obviously, during my, my doctorate, I turned it, I got dug in further and further and further. And as I was going on, you know, going past people like John Dee, and of course I started very much in literary terms with Dr. Faustus and Christopher Marlowe. And to me, that's always been very much a kind of central conundrum. I used to write about that when I was younger. Um, so as I went further and further and further back, the name that kept coming up was Marsilio Ficino. And so suddenly I realized that actually that was where I needed to start. And so the whole thing refocused and became um, really about the impact of the, in those days, we thought about it as the Platonic Academy and Marsilio Ficino, um, back in the ye olde days of the 1980s. Um, and, um, you know, their impact on then uh, Renaissance drama. And then after that, I just really stuck with the, you know, with um, Platonism and the Renaissance and Renaissance ideas. And I think these days, looking back, I'm more and more interested in what makes, what is distinctive here? What do we mean when we say Renaissance philosophy? Um, and, um, you know, are there any real characteristics? How do we compare it with modernity? How do we compare it with um, scholasticism, for instance? Um, and um, how do we how do we situate these individuals? What are the trends? Um, and I think that's something that you know the big names in in my field. You know, people like Paul Oscar Cristello or Eugenio Garin or um, Michael J. B. Allen. I think this is something that fixates everybody, and it's still that question out there you know we all know Ficino is is a giant mm -hmm. um and yet not studied mm -hmm. in intellectual history and the history of ideas um and it's partly because we don't know how to convey what this is mm -hmm. um and I'm not I'm trying to avoid grand narratives but I'm not satisfied by local epistemes, if that makes sense. To yeah, you. that makes sense. Yeah. Do you? Do, um, you, do you, I was going to ask. Do you? Uh, do you still have uh, frustration? You know, you had that frustration at when you first read um, Yeats. Do you still have that yeah. frustration at the? And it's quite a common academic thing these days, I find, with that. If we just compare everything against each other and find all these likenesses, oh, this is like that. This is like that. Then we've somehow worked something out. Whereas very few people seem to want to really sit down and say let's take this thing on its own merit do you do you still find that a frustration i do i do and i think that the more i get immersed the more i think that it's really really crucial for us to take nothing completely as portrayed somewhere else in a way you know i mean crit if critical theory shows us anything it's that the first thing one needs to do is to go look for yourself and go explore for yourself and then try and rebuild with those different authorities, et cetera, but with a real perspective um, on, you know, what you what you think. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm now kind of... I have a... I, I talked about local epistemes mm. earlier. You know, it's that question around truth, right? Um, you know, and... I always said to students when I used to teach more, um, you know, unfortunately what we're doing in many respects is having to unlearn what you learn at school. And that's not school's fault per se, in some cases it might be, um, but it's like you have to take apart what you were taught in order to learn further. 
-hmm. And then, you know, one of the realizations you come to the more you get into scholarship is that that is something that you have to keep doing. If mm -hmm. you don't question mm -hmm. the basic assumptions, then you're really that, that you're really not going to move forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are many things that we could talk about. And I know you want to talk to me about today where I think I am still doing that. So I see myself as a student, really, on a mm -hmm. journey, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Much like Ficino himself, we could say. Oh, well, I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Well, um, before we uh, jump forward into the work of Ficino, I, of course, have to ask you the uh, hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh, Marsilio Ficino is already sat there waiting for three others to enter. Uh, who do you pick? So, when answering this, I tried to think about what was going to make him most happy <laughs> as well as me most happy because it's very important to me that Pacino is happy. Mm. Um, so my answer is extremely banal, but I do think that um, this, this would be both my pl happy place and his happy place. So I would immediately add Plotinus and Plato mm -hmm. um, because I think also they would all make each other happy. Mm -hmm. uh, so Plotinus gets to chat with Plato, Ficino gets to be in awe of all of them, and, and me too. Mm -hmm. um, and then you kind of complicated things by putting Ficino as a, as a kind of, it feels like, what well, I get the Bible as the first book in Desert Island Discs. Um, so um, I, I didn't realize that you were already going to give me Ficino. Um, so I had, a more, I had another think about it, and I thought, okay, who's going to make Plato really happy? And it's be Socrates, right? And so banal answer, but it's uh, it's Pacino, Plotinus, Plato, and Socrates. And the more I thought about it, the more I figured that Socrates is really going to dominate the conversation. Mm. Mm. Um, but and I'm not necessarily sure how productive that is because I get a sense from him that you know Plato may have been more interesting. Um, but um, but hey, I, mm. I would, I mean, why not? How, how would the room differ if I hadn't already put Ficino in there? Uh, it would be Ficino, Plotinus, and Plato. Ah, okay, I see, I see, okay. Sorry, yeah, mm. I just... Uh, I see what you mean. So adding in Socrates would, yeah, he would definitely, he would definitely dominate. I, and I think probably Plotinus would probably take take a back seat, really. From, what, from everything I understand about him, he would probably be quite a reserved frail <laughs> you know individual who would probably be thinking you know this is all a bit self-indulgent i yeah yeah but like don't you want him at the table so that you can ask him questions oh absolutely yeah absolutely I, it's funny though I, I i totally agree with you james it's like i was thinking about that and then i thought, thought to myself is that do we think of him that way just because of the nature of the aeneas though do you know what i mean I mean, that would be my first question to him: Is what order are these men to be in? Because we, we keep <laughs> well, we keep disagreeing about it. Well, they're not supposed to be in any order because mm. Porphyry took apart Plotinus's works and reorganized them into the Aeneids. Mm. So, okay. okay. So basically, it's like somebody taking apart my books and arranging it thematically. So, okay. what did Marcino say about? The cosmos. What did mm. Pico say about the cosmos? What did Bruno say about the cosmos? Rather than you know, like mm. looking at each of them as individuals. So, yeah, he wrote different books and then Porphyroi helpfully reorganized. Mm. Somewhat helpfully. I don't know, it'd be interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, I mean, you... <clears throat> yeah, I see what you mean about Socrates. But, I mean, outside of that, with with these four four figures, do you think really the conversation is is actually going to, you know, jump really back to we're all just trying to find truth? And it would just be a discussion about truth, or do you think there might be a few things that are a bit more specific for them in question, which which they'd be drawn to? I I think I think it's an opportunity to find out how each other read each other. Um, so I think it's about interpretation. Hmm. Um, and the reason why I fought Socrates in the end is also because of the importance of the oral tradition. It, especially with the first three. So Socrates, it's all oral. So really he represents the oral tradition. You know, what we don't have are Plato's lectures. 
which of course were always supposed to be this kind of extra layer on the dialogues, mm. you know, almost this kind of like Pythagorean mystique around the lectures and what he did say or didn't say. Um, and then the same with Plotinus, because we, you know, um, and I must admit, I should look up how to pronounce Porphyry uh, rather than Porphyry. I, I, that's an old pronunciation. Um, but we don't really know what Porphyry did. We don't know what all the lost stuff, stuff said. We don't know whether we're reading Porphyry's version. And, you know, it's funny because I, I do think that goes back maybe to my original feeling when reading Yates too, which is that um, that's why I don't, I don't necessarily, I, I'm very fond of interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity because I think that, you know, the tools that, that I gain from interpretation with literature have really facilitated some of my own thinking when it comes to philosophy. I, you know, I didn't have a, a, a straight on philosophy training and I didn't have a straight on training as a historian. Mm. And most of my colleagues in this field are really from the history, you know, have that type of history training, intellectual history. Um, so I'm coming at it from a more interpretive stance. Um, and um, I do think that is that is a bonus, you know, bringing bringing disciplines together and the skills and tools from each can can support that type of the, the inquiry that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. So, yeah, I think all of them. I mean, Pacino wants to understand what Plotinus was going on about, uh, you know, and and I know Pacino would have definitely wanted to know what Plato thought. Mm. I am not so convinced whether Plotinus really wanted to know what Plato thought, if you see what I mean. I, you know, whether he was just doing his own thing. Poor Plotinus, mm. he seems to be being excluded from this a bit, but he was so important to Pacino's ideas and obviously so important to Proclus and Iambicus which which um, particularly Proclus was also very important for Pacino, so Iambicus too. So, you know, you can't leave him out. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and frankly, I want to hear from all of them, and isn't it my choice? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, well, no, I think I think it's a great room, but I, yeah, I, and I think Pacino would probably end up, would just end up sitting back, you know? Was that, was that in his character to sit back, or do you think he would uh, perhaps... Uh, you know, interject. Um, I don't know. I think, I think in that scenario, I think he would. Uh, yeah, I think he would interject and ask questions. But you know, the the something that I wrote about in my book was Pacino's self fashioning mm -hmm. um, as the ideal Platonic philosopher. This attempt to kind of like restore the platonic academy to you know to somehow um base himself and and what he did and how he worked and acted on socrates um and, and plato um so it's somewhat difficult to know you know exactly but but i i do believe that I do believe that the self-fashioning was pretty close. I get the feeling it was pretty close to his actual character. I'm sorry, the cat's asking to go out on this side. Um, I do get the impression that um, that it was pretty close to his character, just incredibly positive, mm -hmm. um, you know, to the point of potentially being really irritating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for some people. Because some people express irritation, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, like um, uh, you know, he he was on a he was on a his own journey, and um, he just seems to have been somebody who was incredibly positive, very upbeat, very engaged with life, always willing to give. You know, there's a few there's a few signs in his letters when he gets annoyed at people. But he was also very mindful, as I said, of the self-fashioning piece. Mm. So, for instance, you know, um, after Pico died, he was involved in the editing process of Pico's work. And so it's sometimes hard to know 
you know, maybe where Ficino tweaked a few things to make sure that Pico agreed with him or that Pico wasn't mean to him or because Pico was pretty mean to him in his first ever written work um, in a kind of like, you know, I'm better than him type of way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, it's a good thing. You mentioned those those three thinkers right at the start that you, you, you've written on Ficino, Pico and Bruno. And it's a good thing we haven't got a room with Bruno in really because then then we do know who would uh, take the floor. Bruno would definitely take yeah. the floor. Yeah. Yes. When I, everything yeah. I've read about Bruno is he's basically the definition of a, of a smart ass. <laughs> well, notice I didn't invite Pico into the room mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 think, I think Pico in the room might have also led to us listening to Pico. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's uh, one of the one of the weird things, and this is something I still haven't kind of grappled with, but there does seem to be certain, there's a certain personality, um, a, a, a certain kind of arrogance that seems to go with one or two folks whose philosophy I'm interested in. And I'm not quite sure whether that's just my bad luck or, but having to deal with Pico's sense of privilege um, mm -hmm. is, uh, is interesting. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, you, but it does. But again, it's always like, okay, how do we, how do we potentially even take that apart? You mm -hmm. know, like let's not just say the guy was a bit of a jerk when, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, let let's see why he's talking about exceptionalism, why he sees Pico believes that the only, you know, um, only uh, a gentleman can be a philosopher. You know, why why does he say that? Is, is it just because that's what he wants to do? Therefore, now it's a gentlemanly pursuit. You know, why is Bruno being vocal from the treetops? Was it just a form of self-promotion because he needed people to read his books and earn some money or, you know, get patronage? Or what are we talking about here? So, or is it just a character? And now I'm getting into some sort of more romanticism approach. Is it just a characteristic of, you know, people who are going out there and asserting that they, like, got something that changes everything and it's completely original you know mm, mm. i mean it, it sort of does draw us into a sort of a beginning of a uh, of building a foundation for vicino with this you know so we're talking 15th 15th century century mm -hmm. and this is really vicino's historical situation but the academic situation seems to be that there is being a there, well, there is a platonic revival could we call it almost because we're talking about these these traits of um you know exceptionalism of a position of philosophy as this as this almost like it comes across as almost like a cornerstone of society and it's a very platonic thing and could we say almost a very classical thing that there's there's almost being a classical restoration and perhaps that's another reason why such people see themselves this way this way is because they're not only trying to restore the you know not, not only trying to restore Plat platonism or the platonic academy but there's also a restoration of that that character of of plato's day you know, of them holding this position. But um, yeah, I guess just a, a, an opening to sort of historically situate Pacino. Oi, uh, well, <laughs> that's that's incredibly complicated as a, as a, as a framing question. Um, I would say that let's make sure that we're not eliding what Pacino was trying to do with humanism. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, there is a debate around Pacino as a humanist. Um, and he is not a humanist per se. And, um, you know, we can describe humanism in various different ways. We can describe it as an in strong interest and in pursuit of philology in terms of, you know, these classical texts that are now emerging. Um, would you like me to give us some of the historical background around that? Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, I mean, like, you know, when do we date Renaissance from? It, it's really hard to know. Obviously, Pet Petrarch is um, in the 13th century. Um, he, uh, you know, he's considered in many respects the founder of the Renaissance because it's the revivified Rome. It's the revivified Roman Empire. There's a certain dose of nationalism going on in his thinking. Um, you know, it's the bringing back of the idea of poetics and classical thought that go along with the, with the Roman Empire. But it's also, you know, the ascent of Montfort too, 
it's also the um thinking about um interiority um you know which is really important um i mean when you read the ascent of mongol too it's really interesting to juxtapose that with um the fact that piers the plowman was written i think what 10 or 20 years after um petrarch wrote the ascent and in that it's very much a medieval text of it, you know where the interiority is exteriorized mm. you know the journey of the soul you know through the world um whereas you know um petrarch is distinguishing between the outside and the inside and looking inwards in a very different way um so we could say that is a characteristic but then you can't you've then got the black death and in many respects that kind of interrupted a lot of that early flourishing that you see around petrarch and his influence and you see it in art etc but even so you know um you've got humanism arriving in uh florence um pretty early um and i think there was something like three humanist chancellors of the republic of florence you know even before fucino really got going mm -hmm. um and there was a lot of work um study of classical literature um there already were texts that were being translated Greek studies had already started to a certain extent so humanism was flourishing from that perspective as i said an interest in philology an interest in um original classical texts um an interest in how these classical texts could impact particularly um uh civil life civil society so it's the connection between um ideas in the classical world and the creation of a good citizen for example so all of these things are connected to humanism it's not what fucino is doing mm -hmm. um and um you know i mean obviously he was a translator but he's not per se a philologist um you know he um was interested in the active versus the contemplative life but he's definitely not focused on how to develop a good citizen you know he worked outside of the university structure which by the way the universities especially around florence but well everywhere were more based on um studying for professions mm. so the humanist university tended to be these sort of more um um uh studia um uh idea that you see growing up in florence which is kind of like um it's not for the professions it's more of what you might call a kind of a liberal arts um education that's mm, occurring mm -hmm. based on humanist ideas so that's why some of the people around Ficino like Angelo Poliziano or, or Cristoforo Landino were lecturing at the studia you know and they were not connected with the university um so so humanism is its own thing and yes Ficino is distinguishing himself from that and pico even more so he's being very overt um because also humanism is associated with the tradition of rhetoric and how to write well um you know these things all interconnect and pico for instance is is really very very vocal and um one of his first um important pieces was a um letter disputing the role of rhetoric Mm -hmm. um and saying that philosophy was more important but of course he writes it in an incredibly stylish manner so he's able to prove his point by showing that he's also a master of rhetoric um which is kind of cool but um so we got humanism and then we have philosophy now it's a very interesting question you ask have we reinvented philosophy then i don't know i've just thought about that um obviously it's not the type of philosophy that is occurring in scholasticism and it's not the type of philosophy that is associated with the arts faculties um of the time um so again we have we're at a period when you know we've got the church mm -hmm. and theology and philosophy within that you know and obviously represented by people like William of Ockham or or um Thomas Aquinas most famously um so scholasticism as a movement but scholasticism is also in the theology faculty of the universities and then you have 
philosophy being taught separately um, within the arts faculty. Um, and that it's more focused on, um, uh, it's more focused on non-theological questions per se, mm. and it tends to be, uh, very Aristotelian focused as formed particularly through Averroes, um, renegotiation or recovery of Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've kind of got that separation occurring, which then in turn leads to this notion um, which people, which, which has got a very bad rap, um, of the double truth, um, uh, which is that something, because then how do you equate these two things, right? Mm -hmm. How do you equate a conversation about God in a theology faculty with a conversation about God, you know, or, or, or the, the, the first cause, the, um, in Aristotle? Um, and the answer is that you start doing things that's called a double truth so that you have, you can have two things which are concomitantly true. One that is based on belief and faith and theology and that which is church doctrine. And then you have this other view, which is somehow derived from Aristotle. Um, that's a very degenerate way of thinking about it. And we shouldn't overblow the double truth. But I do think there's something very interesting there when one thinks about philosophy at this period and moving onwards, because, um, you know, then you really get into what's true. And if you think about it another way, one could say that that has simply been replaced by scientific truth. Mm -hmm. You know, have you have theological truth, which is based on, like, nowadays it tends to be based on belief. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, and faith, um, but also tries to work philosophically. Um, and then you have scientific truth. Um, and there's, I'm sure there's lots of examples one could think of where the two try to coexist. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, it, and in many respects, the, the present conversations around abortion, for instance, could mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. reflected on in that way. Um, so where does philosophy fit? Well, that's an interesting question. I was thinking about it over the weekend, actually, leading up to this conversation. And again, I keep, I know I keep going over out to wider, wider mm -hmm. issues than Ficino, but I do think that, that in describing what Ficino is, you know, philosopher or what, um, I do think that this is germane that, um, the, what, it, maybe the better question is what is theology? You know, I mean, theology is the study of God. Mm -hmm. um, but Plato talks about God. We about wouldn't say Plato one. is a theologian. So is Plato a theologian? Or but because the thing is, if if you then think about well, what is theology as we study it in universities today? Theology is actually Christian, the Christian tradition. Mm. It is only the Christian tradition. You know, when you think about studying other things, you think about comparative religions, mm -hmm. not theology. So it's almost like the philosophical component, the philosophy has been captured. Mm -hmm. And so we have a separation between a broader thing, which is philosophy, which is always, you know, I mean, like you can go back and I mean, yeah, maybe the, there's always been these divisions between the Milesians and the Ionians, for instance, in the pre-Socratics, right? There's always been these divisions, but there has always been, you know, the one or the creator or whatever, these questions, the question of soul or of mind or whatever, all of these questions have always been there and it's artificial in many respects to separate them. So maybe that's where I'm coming to is mm. that, it's we really need to redefine what we mean by theology rather than me having to come up with ever more un arcane ways of saying that what I do crosses the borders between what, you know, between talking about God and talking about um, more traditional, more traditional mm -hmm. philosophical problems. Well, so, it's an extremely important and um, yeah, it's an extremely important point because what I guess what happens there as well is people end up splitting what they feel is correct to study within their within their so-called bounds. So if you if you think, well, no, if you're talking about God, you go study theology. But as you've said, theology is really 
theology of already predetermined theology. So it's like, well, we've got these this stuff we consider theology. Now we go from that, as opposed to you know, uh, with with Plato. I mean, he's he's beginning from first causes in a, in what we would now consider mm -hmm. a philosophical uh, mindset or tradition, and then moving into it. So, but then if you moved over to philosophy and said, well, I want to talk about God, and say, well, this is more theology, and you'd get caught in a sort of bind. Um, so that in between space, as you've said, I mean, and that to, to, to draw the man in himself, that in between space is, is a place that Ficino is inhabiting extremely practically as well, because he's not only is he a, is he a philosopher uh, and a translator and a, you know, a Platonist, he's also literally a priest. Yes. So we have everything in one and he's struggling with this as well. Yes, he is. Yeah. Only I, I'm not sure. I think he was incredibly canny. I hate to kind of like, I hate to do too much character analysis here because I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I, reading his letters and looking at his moves, he was very, very canny. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't join the priesthood, I think, until he was 40. Mm -hmm. And then he, you know, he was a canon. So he didn't join an order or anything, you know, like in terms of, um, you know, because Pico was constantly towards the end of his life, Savonarola was trying to get him to join the Dominicans. And it looks like he never did. But, you know, it, there was always that pressure because then you kind of, you get wrapped in the arms of Mother Church. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I think it's really important to remember that those times were not just where theology was dominant, but we are talking about theocracy mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the same way as we're talking about theology, which is theocracy, the rule of Christian, uh, the rule of the church even though the church, obviously, there was a separation between, you know, rulers of states and the, the, and the ruler of the church, we are living in a theocratic world. Um, and that, you know, you had to be very, very careful what you were doing. Um, and he was super careful, very thoughtful, always trying to make those connections. And I think he sincerely believed that one needed, one should, make those connections because if you're really going to transform then you have to transform from within mm -hmm. you know and I, I do think that a lot of what he was doing trying to bring together platonism and christianity was related to his desire to revivify christianity and you know and to be able to reform what would have become what this theocratic system and he was not alone in that um as we know I mean, we're talking about a very crucial period in terms of the relationships of the church to its subjects, so to speak, um, and to other states. Um, and um, I mean, the church had been in trouble for quite some time. Um, and, um, you know, and another thing that really bridges the three people that I've just mentioned in this trilogy is that relationship to the theocracy and how they dealt with it. Obviously, you know, Pico, Pico's book, um, <clears throat> The Conclusions, The 900 Theses, sometimes called, was the first book to be burnt at the stake in a lovely symbolic move, you know, and he had to flee and was actually arrested um, uh, and held in a prison until in, in France and got out of the situation because he had to, happened to be either personally good mates or through other people, good mates with the King of France, which is always a bonus in these situations. Bruno, obviously not so lucky. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it was, it was a line and Ficino was very canny about how he walked it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we should, and it was obviously, it was uh, De, uh, De Medici who funded uh, Ficino's translation. So Medici originally said, I want you to translate these these Platonic te Plato's texts, mm -hmm. but then Medici comes across the Hermetica and says, "Stop your mm -hmm. translation of Platonism and translate this." So, was Ficino's interest in Platonism was that a natural, like an organic interest from himself, or was was it initially was it just a job? Um. Oh God, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that makes me want to go back and, and dig further. I'm not sure how we're going to know, because the trouble is that 
I'm not sure how you can answer that. Maybe in his letters. Um, but as I said, his letters, he even prepared many of his letters for, for publication. And so it is very much a kind of a corpus that he cultivated. Mm, <laughs> so, mm. you know, and he did burn two of his earlier works, um, you know, because one of them was on uh, Lucretius, um, uh, Epicurean, um, who was considered a bit wobbly um, when it came to the whole kind of theocracy element. Um, so he repented and recanted and burnt that. Um, so can we say that he always had a strong interest in um, the, the revival of classical th philosophy? Absolutely. Right. All the evidence shows that. Plato in particular, don't know. Um, uh, but I can tell you the two things. First of all, he wasn't only patronized by, um, by the Medici family. Um, that is another of those stories um that you get around Ficino, um which he encouraged um because the medici were the ruling party so to speak up to a certain point um and um so he was very much it's all about cosimo and glorifying you know cosimo as the father of the nation um and you know he brought these wonderful books to Ficino and anointed Ficino to translate them all but in reality, we are talking about something a little bit more complicated. You know, he actually had patrons before Cosimo and after Cosimo. And obviously, Lorenzo, he wasn't always friendly with Lorenzo de Medici or Magnifico. And so this stuff goes in and out. So there's always that kind of process of trying to ingratiate yourself to the different patrons. Now, regarding um the corpus hematicum which i believe in this case was the pimanda that we're talking mm. about because obviously asclepius was already out there on the about um so um did facino believe that was more important than plato i don't know he believes that he certainly believes that homies trismegistus was a real philosopher he certainly believes that Hermes Trismegistus was prior to Plato, and he also believes in the power of antiquity, that, you know, that there is this sense that God reached down to Adam and whispered in Adam's ear some secrets, and then there was a line. And unfortunately, there's a sense of kind of Chinese whispers, so you have to kind of recover the truth and the truth can get more diffuse as it goes on potentially so so it's quite possible he did say all right yeah let let's focus on the hematica on the pimanda mm. um uh but um i don't know whether ultimately he thought that was more important he didn't go back to it afterwards i will say that okay um so he um so inevitably i think he loved Plato, um, and he didn't think that the, the Pimanda was unimportant, but he went on and pursued Plato after that and focused on it, and, and commentators of Plato, and also some um, commentators on Aristotle as well. So, I mean, you know, he, he did broaden out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and would you say that ultimately for Chino's, for Chino's worldview with respect to... Uh... You know, as you write about it in your book, remarrying philosophy with the religious truth. So, really, what you're talking about, you know, the 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 basics of Christian theology. Are we well? Are we talking about the basics of Christian theology meeting with Platonism to somehow begin to build this foundation? Or what can we call? Now, here's a question for you. I mean, one is that what Ficino's view is, but can we call that like uh, a, a Ficinoian view, or is that simply? Uh, you know, is that a specific thing for Ficino or has this since developed just as a merge of Christian theology and Platonism? So, um, I think that in many respects, um, Ficino was trying to do what Aquinas did for Aristotle. Mm -hmm. So think of it that way. So, you know, because as I said earlier, there was a, a certain tension between um, Aristotle, the recovery of Aristotle 
and how it was being taught in the arts faculties of universities um, and, theo and the, the theology faculty. There was always this tension going on. You know, I mean, it didn't help probably that Averroes was a, was a Muslim, mm -hmm. you know, and also Averroes, ironically, his first intention was to try and marry Aristotle to Islamic <laughs> religion. So it kind of goes back and back and back. So there's probably echoes of that. I haven't studied Averroism sufficiently to, to be able to answer that question. But I do think there's some really interesting parallels there. So anyway, so the Averroan recovery um, of Aristotle did not necessarily go down well everywhere. Aquinas was the one who somehow found a way of wrapping it up um, you know, in a way that the church could swallow. And that's why he had such an enormous impact. It didn't mean that he was, that Aquinas was the foundation of all Aristotelian thinking when Ficino was working, for example. I mean, if you look at the University of Padua, you know, the, the arts faculty there, which had an enormous influence on the Renaissance recovery of Aristotle, which is the second recovery, um, were considered very Averroan, whatever that means by that point, before they really started, like people like Nepho going back and like really beginning again with, with Aristotle's text. So they were doing something similar, um, around the same, same time as Ficino with Aristotle. And so they were no longer simply reading through Averroes. So, um, Ficino, I think, was trying to do what Aquinas did. Um, and ironic, and, and did try to use Aquinas as part of this foundation, mm. which means that what you end up with is something that is not completely platonic. <laughs> it's got a little twist of Aristotle here and there, which is a bit of a nightmare, as you can imagine. But mm. I guess that's what, you know, Renaissance philosophy and history of ideas is all about, right? Trying to unravel and work out how that happened and why. Um, so you do have all of those conversations, those key conversations that Aquinas tried to rehearse and solve are popping up again in texts like the uh, Theologia Platonica, um, the Platonic Theology, which is one of which one could call Ficino's Summa, you know, his main big work, but there were others as well, um, which is based on the question of the immortality of the soul, which is, um, which of course was a really key topic both for Aquinas and for Ficino and then later on even with the folks in Padua so you have Pompanazzi later in the early 16th century so it's a kind of an ongoing story there so um it's a mix not the same mix though as you see in Pico Pico is very much saying what happens if I try to provide a concord between Aristotle and Plato mm. So, which is a completely different story and another podcast. Um, but, but Ficino is trying to bring those things together, but utilizing things that the church would recognize and accept as ways of bringing together classical philosophy with Christianity. So he's trying to be deferential to various church fathers. He's trying to be deferential to key thinkers and authorities like Aquinas. Now, did it work? Um, I suppose it worked in the sense that, and I'm thinking on my feet here, it worked in the sense that he didn't get banned <laughs> and people read him for centuries afterwards. So if you compare that with, say, Bruno, yeah, it worked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good job for Chino. Um, so... Um, did he create a new foundation for Platonism and Christianity? No, but there are certainly lots of ways in which he was influential. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, of course, I, I'm sure you're aware that there's this wonderful, flourishing, esoteric tradition that passed through him as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and was very much turned in certain directions by his thinking. 
So that kind of marriage between Platonism and Christianity had some really interesting outputs later on. Um, I think I said somewhere in my book, I'm not sure, that, you know, sometimes reading Foucault's pendulum echoes Foucault's pendulum. It's like reading a compendium of people who were influenced by or using or misusing or whatever, but a Ficino. Um, so he, he has a series of influences in all sorts of directions. Um, some of them, I don't know if, you, if there's such a word, exoteric, some of them esoteric. But the fact is that he did have that powerful influence and his translations were accepted and were the most important platonic um, translations until about the 18th century. And people read Plato through the lens of Ficino. Mm -hmm. So even though maybe that's not what he was looking for, maybe him dancing that line and trying to bring those things together allowed other things to happen. And I do wonder also, it's something I haven't pursued, but I do wonder also whether his conversations around things like the immortality of the soul did have an impact on, you know, the, the church finally recognizing that the soul is immortal in the early 16th century. I don't know. Uh, as I said, haven't looked into it. But, you know, did it influence the church? He wasn't, he, even though he was within the church, he wasn't within the church in quite the same way as Aquinas was, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, as a canon. Um, and certainly, you know, he also had the bad luck of, you know, you've got Luther not many years after Ficino, and then after that you've got the Counter-Reformation, and things took a dark turn out of that. Things became more radicalized, more theocratic. So, you know, the opportunity was missed from that point of view. So, I, you know, but it's still an interesting question, like what impact maybe his theories on immortality of the soul may have had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where would we begin with the question of, of actually slowly building up as much as we can uh, on, in a, on a podcast, building up his... Uh, his view of the world did he did he begin from anywhere s specific did he begin from the idea of the universe the idea of you know the cosmos or you know how can we begin to structure this um well i think he he let, let's start with the cosmos because i that's probably where he would start he starts with the one so I believe that the first three books that he really focused on were um, uh, Philebus, uh, Phaedrus, and um, and I'm probably murdering, because I'm not trying even the Greek pronunciations, I'm thinking more of the way he wrote them, um, and um, Parmenides. Mm -hmm. um, so, and all of them, the reason why he took them was because of the 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 discussion about the one, the discussion about the good, the discussion about limit and um, the infinite, um, and then of course the journey of the soul. So I, let's so let's start with the grand drama. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's probably where he would appreciate. Um, now I will say as a caveat, as always caveats, he is not entirely consistent on all these things, and he wrote a lot. And I have not read it all yet. Um, I intend to go back to Ficino actually when I'm done with Bruno. Um, so I'm, I've got another project I want to work on. Um, so um, I, I have not read it all. Mm -hmm. um, and he is not, but as far as I'm aware, he's not, it's really hard putting stuff together sometimes. And because there's so much, it's even harder to put the architecture together. But I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go out there and say that my present understanding is that we have the one, right? The Platinian one. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that, um, because the first question then is, of course, well, what attributes does the one have? Does the one have any attributes? Um, so he does seem to say that the one has the attributes of being the truth mm -hmm. and of being the good. But of course, then the one can't have specific attributes, but not other attributes, because the one is everything. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I would, so I'm going to put it differently and say that the one is everything. Um, but I think you could also say that there is um, a first act that occurs. Um, and the first act is connected to the, and the first act and the first coming back um, is connected to truth and the good. So, so shall we say in the hierarchy, good and true for the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, it's always been, of course, a question in Platonism as to how that occurs. So I'm not going to go into all that now because we only have a few hours here. Um, but what I do find interesting, certainly what I have read about, have read of Facino is that the whole kind of via negativa, the, you know, the idea of the philosophy of negation so that the one is nothing and everything because the one can't have any attributes, so is nothing. Or um, is in Ficino, there is a real emphasis on everything. And so from that perspective, there is definitely a more kind of positive, there's more ways in which you can talk. It's not quite that pseudo Dionysian Christian mystical or Pico-esque, you know, journey into the cloud of unknowing and we, can't, we all have to shut up now because we can't say anything. So, um, so it's definitely more of an overflowing of the everything. And so this overflowing, of course, is emanation. Um, and the first overflowing, the first act um, is connected to truth as i'm trying to remember um but the two attributes the truth and good and that leads to mind which is also the home of being so being is not in the one it is the first it is the first step down where mm -hmm. being is so because he's connecting obviously the one is god mm -hmm. um not much work to do there pretty easy um, except we're no longer obviously hopefully thinking about white beards and everything. Um, but then we get to, um, the mind, um, and the mind suddenly becomes the angelic mind. So, and it is the home not only of the, um, of being and mind, um, cause mind is connected to being, um, but also of, um, cause nothing can be until being is produced, which mm -hmm. is another why we have this problem with attributes um and but but also the home of the logos um which is obviously pre-christian as well um but the logos obviously specifically here is jesus and of the angels so everybody's all in together mm. um and therefore can also be considered the second part of the trinity so we're sticking the trinity in here um which is of course deeply problematic um, and later, um, followers, Pico and Bruno, they constantly come up to, up to, they, they constantly have a problem, um, with this because emanation suggests hierarchy. And of course, you know, uh, Christian dogma, the church dogma at the time says that, you know, the Trinity is one and the, that nothing is above one or the other in the Trinity. So that is deeply problematic. So they end up looking like they're denying the Trinity. Um, so Ficino kind of got away with it. Um, so we've got the angelic mind. And then next step down in the imagery uh, process is the realm from the fixed stars downwards. And it's the tr traditional Aristotelian cosmos, essentially, the, the unit, you know, the celestial worlds, the different layers. Um, from Saturn down to the moon. And then in line with Aristotle, you then got the sub-celestial world, which is the world of nature. Um, and the celestial world, because we're being Trinitarian here, is the world of the anima mundi, the soul of the world, which nicely fits in with the Holy Ghost. And that's the attempt to equate the, the two. And of course, one could easily argue that, in fact, that's what the Christian fathers, the, not the, the Christian bishops, my apologies, at, the, at Nicaea were kind of doing anyway. 
you know, and then you have this whole debate as to what the Trinity is um, and the hierarchy. So um, the Holy Ghost is there. Ficino adds another soul, which is interesting, um, because especially when you start thinking about Bruno, because he adds a um, body of the cosmos, which is the which is nature. Mm-hmm. So the anima mundi has a body, which is the world. Um, and you know, and then now you've got an interesting debate later on with Bruno because he he actually gives souls the planets. Um, so okay. um, that's another story. Um, so that's the basic structure of the cosmos. It's all peopled. So at the top level, you've got the one, and then you've got um, then you've got the angels, then you've got the um, gods of the planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and you've got demons, spelled D A E M O N. You know the classical D. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know because Socrates had a demon talking to him, you know, on the banks of the Alyssus in Phaedrus, um, and so we have to have demons. But then what the hell do we do with demons? Well, I, I guess literally, what the hell do we do with demons? Um, and so he makes demons a kind of a lower daimon, if that makes sense. Now I'm trying to pronounce them differently. Um, so you keep you, you keep your daimons and mm-hmm. some of them demons, thus managing to bring the idea of um, you know demonic forces you know, still into play. But of course, you know, there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't work. Um, and we can go into that in more detail. Um, and, but that's a kind of a broad, is this, mm. would you like to delve into any of that more? Well, I would always, I'm always, uh, you know, I'm the human narcissist, so I need to know what role man plays in all this. Uh, well, first of all, not man. I mean, we don't say that anymore, thank goodness. Um, so what, what, do, what, what role do we play? We play. Um, well, I mean, he's using, basically, he's using a, um, uh, a medieval idea, medieval set of ideas and prior. So, I mean, again, this isn't, this isn't just Pacino. He's using a, he's using a pre-existing idea that, um, that, uh, the, the human being is at the center of the macrocosm mm. and it's the microcosm. Um, which essentially is where you get that whole kind of thing in, um, uh, in magic, for instance, of as above, so below, right? Mm-hmm. And vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's the macrocosm, microcosm story. So, um, but he does something very interesting with it because he gives, because he really promotes the idea of free will. Um, and so the free will is that actual central point at the center of the microcosm at the center of the macrocosm which means that um uh you know we we we're able to to move in different directions but it's the basically he's taking the idea of chain of being the golden chain and of the you know situating us at the center so but how he does it of course is very different because everybody's got their own way of doing it so um he's following uh platonic ideas but making his own choices so he doesn't for instance he doesn't follow and he's also by the way attempting to negotiate a hidden conversation in his work which he doesn't like many people at the time he doesn't openly say okay now we're going to talk about aristotle's argument on this Mm -hmm. instead he's doing it de facto same with aquinas or whatever um and um he so he's taking the whole conversation on the active intellect from De Anima, Aristotle's De Anima, uh, which was really important, and and trying to kind of like look at that and square it through Christianity and Plato and what he ends up, and of course Plotinus, who has that undescended part of the mind. But what he ends up with is a mind that is part of our soul. It's the upper half of our mind. So our mind reflects the angelic mind. Um, it is in many respects a passive faculty. It only ever looks upwards and it's not necessarily engaged in, um, it, well, it probably isn't engaged. And we in us 
and we ne we tend not to engage with it because we're too busy doing other things. Um, and it looks upwards always, but it does create it does contain just as the angelic mind contains the ideas or forms because it is a Platonic Christian universe. So the mind of the soul contains what, what are known as seeds or formulae, which are the seeds or the formulae of the original ideas or forms. Mm -hmm. And they can be activated and they can be active and influence us. But the only way they can be activated is if we somehow gain access to our minds. Mm -hmm. So the next level down um, of the soul, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the soul here. So that's the mm -hmm. upper level is the mind. The next level down is the reason, mm -hmm. which contains the will, right? Um, and so that's the thing that can look to the mind and then activate, and then the formulae and the seeds will get activated. But it is the, the jury's out on whether they can, you can do that on your own. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because... Pacino tends to emphasize that it's a reaching upwards and a reaching downwards. Um, and, that, and that's the that's the point, really, the very, very subtle theological point where people end up getting, you know, is it all man's work or is it a work of grace? And that's where if you don't lean one way, you end up on a stake. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, all the people that I think about have different views on this, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but Pacino doesn't think about does he really say grace? I'm just trying <laughs> to think. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the Vermont train coming by here. Um, there's only two a day, but um, <laughs> this comes away at right, right, the best moment. Um, I'm just trying to think if he if he uses the word grace. Um, he might. Um, I'd have to go back to that and uh, look in some more detail. But because Pico also talks a lot about this one as well. I'm trying to remember what word he uses. It's escaped my mind just right now. But um, it's not, I think maybe, I, I'm going to move away from the word grace. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it somehow says that it's like, and I'm sure that's not what one means by grace, but it's almost like a kind of laissez majesté idea, right? You know, kind of like, yes, all very well, you can have the grace to reach upwards, right? Whereas what we're talking about is something very different. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about love. And that changes everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's very in sync with the way I've been talking about Ficino and his general positivity. You know, I mean, he talks about God's love is essentially the fuel that is keeping all the emanation going. It's the energy that allows emanation, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. um, he calls it the circuitous spiritualis. So the circuit, the spiritual circuit. And it's what keeps the one connected to us and us connected to the one and the nature connected to, you know, everything else, etc. So love to me is different to grace. Mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. not you're being forgiven for anything. No, you're not being forgiven for anything. You're not like, um, you know, this is something that is unrequited either because the love has to be requited. Mm -hmm. So the reason looks up and God reaches down and there is a, mu it's a, it's a mutual love thing. Um, and desire, right? Because desire is another way of talking about love. Um, or, or as I said, you, you could think of it as energy. Um, so, You've got the upper soul, you've got the, uh, which is made up of the mind and the reason. And then below that, you've got the lower soul, which is, um, the, what they call the inward wits in the medieval period. Um, things like, uh, fantasia, uh, or fantasia, sorry, um, or, um, the imagination, because sometimes those are seen as the same, sometimes they're seen as different. Memory is another one. Cogitatio is another one. And then you have the inward senses, like inner vision, inner hearing. Um, and so that completes the soul. Um, and then below the soul, 
you have the spirit, spiritus, which is the vehicle of the soul. Um, so when we think about the Phaedron charioteer, it is the thing that carries the soul um, because the soul can't move of itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it needs a vehicle and it's what, and it's also the kind of like, it's like if you think of that bit in 2001 Space Odyssey where the, the pod is coming down to the moon base, you know, you kind of have to have a receptacle for it to fit into. Um, so you, you should think of the soul and the spirit is carrying it down and it has to fit into the body. Um, Ficino added an extra piece, which is the vital spirit, which is kind of a lower spirit, which is more connected to the body and is the kind of the glue that glues together spirit and body. One of the things you've got to love about Platonism is that because of emanation, you just end endless layers and layers and layers because everything has to flow into the other which is why we have that kind of incredibly by the time we get to Proclus it's so baroque um you know but but it, it's always an interesting question how does one thing lead to the other um and so we have the bot and then so then we have the body and the body has the external senses so um you know so for instance you see you see a horse the picture of the horse is brought into the inward vision which then carries it probably to the like Im, Im, imagination which then carries it maybe to the cogitatio or to reason depending on what day it was you know in terms of Pacino's writings and others on this subject um you know and it gets reasoned out in some ways a certain low level judgment occurs then it gets stored in memory etc or the reason deals with it so and so it goes up but it never while the reason is focusing on that it is not focusing on the mind and so how do you the question the big question is how do you flip the reason and the uh, using the will which of course is the you know means um from the everyday dealing with life towards the mind so that you can awaken the formulae and seeds there and start an active relationship. Um, and, um, and that is the myth of the, obviously the Phaedron charioteer with the two horses, the, the black horse, which is the irrational senses and the white horse, that's the mind. And you're struggling as the soul to kind of, you know, one's trying to go down and the other one's trying to go up and you've got to keep them on a balanced path. Up, you know, on your journey upwards, the journey of the soul. Mm -hmm. That was extremely articulate. Oh, that good. Was, uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it makes it all makes it honestly make all makes complete sense. So, maybe maybe one little question just to look at Facino's structure. Then is where are the most turbulent? What are the most turbulent parts of it with respect to the church? You know, why might they have said, "Oh, hang on, we've looked at your structure of things." What's going on with this little bit? You know, what's this? Well, pretty much every point. I mean, I've, <laughs> you know, I mean, I've already reflected on that problem of the Trinity. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. still have no, I still have no idea how we managed to get away with that. Mm. Um, I think, in many respects, you got to wonder if people really read it properly, or maybe he was just like, I don't know. But um, he somehow managed to get away with. Um, placing the Trinity onto Platonic cosmology and, and managed to make it work. Mm. I think a lot of it is because of the Prisca Theologia, which we can come back to later. So I think that's, that's number one. Um, let me see. Number two, well, obviously, immortality of the soul was not official church doctrine um, and was a very debated point. Um, and, um, so the question of the immortality of the soul was really up in the air, though I suspect you've got to wonder how debatable it really was. Mm. So it, it's odd. It's odd, you know, that it, that it wasn't church doctrine. And as I said, I really haven't delved into that far enough, but it's one of my intentions. M maybe as my next project, I'm interested in, in doing a kind of like, um, a like thinking about the portrayal of the soul and different philosophies of the period. Um, so I don't know why, but it, but it wasn't. 
Um, and it's very contentious because, I mean, for instance, I mean, even now, there are people who think that when you die, you're buried. And, um, you know, and that's it until, you know, Jesus or the Messiah or whatever comes and revivifies corpses and takes you off to heaven. Um, so, um, or those who think of themselves as being part of the elect, for instance, or, you know, part of the rapture, they're going to be taken up and everybody else knows. So, it, so the whole question of whether the soul is immortal seems obvious, but, but actually it is not very settled. Um, and in the many respects, if I'm going to go back right to the beginning of Christianity, you know, if you think about a church that is essentially in its early days was based on the idea of the imminent apocalypse, it's probably not surprising that they weren't busily thinking about the longevity of the soul. They were thinking about preparing for the end days. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so there's that. Um, of course, there is also the fact that um, he not only, I mean, he, we talked about how he was a priest in the canon, but he was also, he was also well known for wanting to be a bit of a, the Socrates, the new Socrates of, he had, you know, this idea of Florence as the new Athens and him restarting the academy as a, just as a concept. Um, you know, he was known for playing a liar. He liked to compose Orphic hymns. He had a really strong opinion on, um, on so-called Pythagorean number theory and harmony. Um, he, you know, he translated the Pimanda. He, was, he had his finger in lots of weird pies. Um, I think that the timing also helped him, um, that, you know, things hadn't gone quite as bad as they would later um, uh, in terms of the church. What else? Um, uh, there was one I was kind of saving. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, he also um, definitely believed in predictive astrology. Um, and in fact, it was part of his training because it was a part of every doctor's training at that time. Um, you know, astrology was used in um, medical practice. And so he learned it there. And he utilized it and obviously wrote about it in three books in life. He also believes in, because of emanation, he also believes in that magical concept of sympathy. Um, you know, in fact, really, he is the most dominant theorist of magic, um, you know, of the period. Um, and maybe of all the periods before him, and not all the periods before him, but like the periods immediately before him, the periods immediately after him too. You know, he's providing a really succinct theory of what magic is because he's saying it's about the energetic connections. It's because of emanation that because things of things emanate, then, you know, what is above connects with what's here. Um, so a certain gemstone can be allied to a certain planet, a certain, you know, um, a, a certain element can be connected to a certain planet. A certain month is connected to a certain, everything fits. Um, and that's why sigils, sigils work. That's why astrology works, etc., etc. So he's providing a really comprehensive theory of what magic is. So he got away with it. Almost didn't. I mean, he was certainly nervous about it. And, um, and wrote when he produced the third book of his three books on life in particular, um, which really contains the more kind of theurgy stuff. Um, I mean, he's super careful to distinguish between theurgical magic, m magic that works in harmony with the universe, um, through sympathia and goetic mag magic, which is calling up demons and, you know, this type of thing. Um, and, but later people who tried to do that and they all followed him, you know, whether you're reading Agrippa or whatever, they all follow his distinction, but increasingly it didn't work. Um, so it is, you know, somehow, yeah, maybe he was at the right time. So there's a lot of stuff that, and Pico, by the way, did have a round with him about astrology and 
you know, Pico's last work, which potentially Pacino slightly edited, we don't know, um, was against that type of astrology. Um, so um, there was definitely a debate going on within his group of friends as well about all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, is there, any, is there anything you think we should touch on with respect to his... So you mentioned uh, the the Pris, uh, Prisca Theologica or Theologia. Um, do you think that's that's key for understanding his structure of the world? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it is. It's still considered one of his primary contributions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a little unfair. What, you know, when you think about all he did do, um, but it is definitely it's one of those pieces that everybody's happy to fall on it because, you know, it's so hard to unravel what comes from where. And so often you're thinking about how people are synthesizing and like making out of synthesis something new and interesting. But in the case of the Prisca Theologia or the Prisca Magia, he really is doing something very, very innovative here, which is creating this line um, from antiquity of people who knew the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and he had a lot of fun with it. And so did the people who came after him. Everybody always messed around and created their own lineage. Um, but what is really interesting about Ficino, and I think that's, this is one of the reasons why maybe the church was always happy too, or, or not happy, but, but that, that it sort of worked for him, was that um, he basically says there's this line. Mm -hmm. um, essentially God and but it wasn't just a historical line, it was a geographical line. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, you know, he wasn't far wrong in many respects. <laughs> so that's what, that's what you have to remember here. This isn't all, this, this, there's a lot of interesting, what we might consider to be truth, and now we go back to truth claims going on here. Um, so he saw it, um, he tried to show how the revelation was given to different groups of people in different places at different times. So it's not just simply that the oldest transferred it to the next oldest, but also that the revelation of God was brought to different groups. So if you look at his Prisca theology that he ended up with, and he kept tinkering with it, by the way. So he took out, for instance, um, Philolaus, Philo, for, um, again, I'm Philolaus, um the um the one of the so-called and i keep saying so-called because that's another show what one calls pythagoreans um you know but certainly a, a pythagorean adjacent thinker who also connected with plato um and is kind of known for um his work on on math and, and heart maths and harmony etc um so he took him out at a certain point. Um, so he was always messing around with, with the line. But basically, he ended up with something that looked a little bit like, um, so we had a revelation to the Asians, which was Zoroaster to the Persians. Mm -hmm. And then we had a revelation, revelation to the Greeks representing Europe, one could say, um, Team Greece, you know, Orpheus and then to Pythagoras and Plato. Mm -hmm. um, and then Team Africa, represented by Hermes Trismegistus. And then finally, Team Peoples of the Book, which was Moses to Judaism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and of course, what's interesting here is that when one thinks about what we now know of the influence, for instance, of the Babylonians, and the Persians on Greek thought and philosophy, you know, this this is this isn't all the influence of the Egyptians on Greek thought or the Egyptians or or the the influence of some Greek ideas on later Egyptian ideas, etc. 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 It's not crazy stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Essentially, he's following a certain tradition of thinking, of revelation. Now um, where the church starts gets more in, gets starts to get more interesting it, is that um, that all goes on until we get Jesus, mm -hmm. and Jesus is the revelation embodied, mm -hmm. and so he gives it all. 
So, and then anything that happens after that is about interpretation. Okay. So we're now in a world of interpretation, which is really unfortunate, but you can see where he was coming from when you think philosophy in many respects have become acts of interpretation rather than original, you know, like this is my philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's another good book to write, isn't it? How did that then transfer into people like Bruno, mm -hmm. you know, where he says very overtly, this is the Nolan philosophy. Um, I, guess, I guess in a way as well, the Reformation sort of proved him right. The, of, of, being an, of, of being an era, well, we're now in the era of um, interpretation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Of interpretation, absolutely. So everything that happens after Jesus arrives is about interpretation. So the church fathers, etc., because we've had the direct revelation in God's Son, uh, which is the direct representation of the angelic mind in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so in somehow or other, he's therefore managed to bridge between so-called pagan thinking and christian thought mm -hmm. but then you know but then could one say but then you've got you, you're hit by all these different problems right which mm -hmm. we're sort of ignoring here which is the fact that Ficino used plotinus heavily he used proclus heavily etc etc now that was post revelation um you could say well they're part of an interpretive tradition because they're interpreting plato but that would be pushing it you know, I mean, essentially what we're saying is anybody before Jesus is, you know, they can have direct original revelation by God. Mm -hmm. Anybody after Jesus, there's no excuse for not simply following Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, so, you you know, you're on, you're on some interesting ground there. And I wonder if he's got more to say on that question. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I, I know there's a new... I haven't read De Christiana Religione, and um, I'm ashamed to say. And um, uh, um, there's a new edition coming out. You, you, you actually um, told yeah, me so about some it. some early, early next year. So it's called on the mm -hmm. on the Christian religion. Yeah, yeah, so so it's, I, yeah. Sorry, it's part, of, part. Well, it's just part of that Ficino Renaissance, right? It's peculiar. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, I'm always interested, especially with authors that have big. Uh, who have written a lot and have big corpuses i'm always interested to see why you know why have you translated that one uh it's always a you know a peculiar thing to see what is what's coming through i i agree and that is the big one that is missing and you know and it wasn't something that i was focused on so much myself but i think it's certainly a huge piece and so very excited to see there's a translation coming out um because you know, trying to get through all that Latin myself um, wasn't going to be a fun task. And I was intending to do it. So it's always nice when you can have a translation and the Latin piece and you can kind of, mm -hmm. you know, work it that way. But, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the foremost, I would say, the foremost translator of um, and editor of Ficino in our times, um, uh, Michael Allen, you know, why did he choose those pieces? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, that would be an interesting question to ask him. But I mean, he he really has done an astonishing job in his career, bringing Ficino to a wider audience with with really amazing translations and editions and thinking. And he's somebody who comes from literature, so I hope a little bit of that pixie dust brushes off a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, well. Would you advise people to begin with Ficino, maybe with the, the Prisca Theologia? Or would you say, I mean, if we're talking first-hand work, I mean, secondary, of course, begin with your own book. But uh, Of first, course. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Ficino's own work, where would you be, uh, advise for people to begin? Um, I think probably, um, ooh, it's always tricky, um, but... Um, I have a very soft spot for uh, his commentary on the Phaedrus. Mm -hmm. um, and because Phaedrus is such an early work of Plato's, and but Ficino saw it as very central. Um, and so I think that whole discussion on beauty and the good there is, is really fascinating. And I think there's a lot of other interesting stuff, obviously, with the Phaedrus charioteer, et cetera, in there. 
Um, but the one that is probably most well known, and of course, I, I will say first off that Pacino never, never really wrote a satisfactory commentary on the Pedras. So it's, all, it's a hard one to kind of, you know, present to people. But the one that was most popular in his day, um, which was, he translated into Italian and did really well, was the commentary on the symposium. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, that's very, very, you know, that's, that's love. Um, and it's been often copied and parts of it should be, if, if you're into the Renaissance at all, um, the whole final piece on, um, Giottina's Ladder should be very familiar to you from other works of the period. For instance, um, Castiglione's The, the, the Courtship. Um, most courtly liter- literature steal from the symposium in one way or the other. Um, so, sorry, that didn't steal. Um, uh, I think borrow. The- borrow, there you go. Um, so, um, that is a good place to start because it's very familiar territory. Um, but I, I personally prefer the more, um, nuts and bolts texts like, as I said, Philebus and, uh, Phaedrus. Because then you get the idea of the cosmology, um, you get the idea of um, the soul. It's, those are good intros, I think. And then go to the symposium, because the symposium presumes that maybe you understand some of that, I think, beforehand. Mm-hmm. And don't start with the Theologia Platonica, because but, um, that, that's a lot. That's okay. a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um... So we can, I'm assuming we can find your own book, Marsilio Ficino and His World, via Palgrave Macmillan's own site, and I imagine many other places on, on the internet. Um, is there anything you would uh, like to add uh, just before we come up to time here? Um, I'm trying to think of what we haven't talked about. Is there any? Is there anything that you? Well, I would. I mean, this is a huge question. I would. I would, did want to ask about his influence today, but as you say, I mean, his mm. influence is seems to be hidden but massive yes <laughs> that that is that's part of the problem and you know i i struggle with this one you know i i once did when i was about 28 i think um i did a job interview for a position that i kind of wanted uh it was the next step in my you know academic ladder thing and you know it, the folks there really, I got the impression they didn't know who Ficino was that we were interviewing, and um, which is quite possibly true. And this person said, well, why should we be interested? And I found that so hard to explain. <laughs> um, you, you know, because where do you start? Mm. I mean, can you imagine, I mean, can you imagine a world, for instance, that didn't know Plato? Mm. You know, and that's just the tip of the iceberg because that's the translation bit. You know, you've had a few other fragments. You know, you've had the fragment, a fragment of Timaeus has always been knocking around, you know, but most of it, you just thought it was lost completely, you know, and suddenly it's there and suddenly it's being explained to you. I mean, this is huge. So the trouble, and then of course all the other things that you put in the commentary and this attempt to assimilate Christianity and Platonism, you know, and then all the different directions it went from love through to, as I said, esoterica, through to, um, uh, through to the pastoral, through to the idea of the mask, through to, I mean, the whole of philosophy. Uh, I, it's really, it's so big that it's really hard. And, but it's a question that I keep coming back to, James, and I'm damned if I'm not going to answer that question in some, I have to somehow put that question together because it is an important question to be able to explain why, you know, why somebody was important, why you should care about them. Um, but I'm sorry, I've got a cat that needs to be let out. It's incredibly hot and humid here. And so I'm keeping the the door shut because of the AC, which he doesn't like. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I would also say that, um, you know, there's been a very, 
there's been a really, really amazing work that came out recently, um, two years ago, three years ago, maybe now. I think maybe it was 2019, Brian Copenhaver's work mm. on magic. I don't know if you've read it in the, um, but, you know, central to that is Facino's conversation around sympathy there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I found very interesting his introduction where he says, I am not going to present a theory of magic. And I, but I think in a way he does because he puts Pacino right there in the center. Mm -hmm. So I wonder maybe if we could just be a lot more um, mindful about like ha what would happen if we did, what would happen if we did put that there? Mm -hmm. um, and what does it mean? And, um, you know, and, and then look at that influence. That's another interesting book that's still to be written. So I think there was still to, a book to be written that is Copenhagen's book, but different, okay. um, which, which I think would be absolutely fascinating. Um, and that's what so, you're going to work on now. Uh, I'm not sure. I just know what it's going to be is that I feel like, I feel like I've marked out the territory, you know, um, and tried to connect a lot of dots. Mm -hmm. I really didn't think I was going to go to Bruno. Mm -hmm. I'd originally thought that I might go back to Petrok, and, I, and then at the last minute, suddenly I ended up with Bruno, which I did not expect to happen. I had a I had a very long night. I've been on a work uh, trip to Uganda, and I was stuck at Doha Airport uh, for nine hours overnight, and there was nowhere to sleep. And I sat there and went through it and through it and through it and eventually just thought, yep, it's Bruno. And I can't believe I've ended up with Bruno. Um, but, um, I really thought second thought was to do somebody else within the Chino sphere. Um, and, but somehow it just, I, I got led there, um, in terms of some of the questions I was asking. So what I would, what I'd be interested in now doing is really essentially taking cross themes and writing books which are almost like um, anatomies of particular subjects that interest me. You know, um, you know, the question of being in late 15th and 16th century thought, the question of the soul, you know, the question of magic, you know, and really trying to produce not like somebody says this, somebody says that, somebody, but to kind of lay it out more with more the theory mm -hmm. and then and, you know to sort of build a um what's the word i'm looking for i keep thinking of um um so not a history of ideas but more of a um life story of the soul if i or mm -hmm. a biography of the soul mm -hmm. do you know what i mean yeah um so that i think could be really interesting and then you're putting together these people's ideas and seeing how where they contradict and you know in a, something that is focused on a particular topic rather than here's a kind of history of ideas thing so I, i'd love to do a few pieces around that right now i think okay uh, i started the last paper i did was on the question of mutability comparing pico's ideas on mutability of the soul with Bruno's and um, it's yeah it's really interesting yeah I mean it all hey. sounds it all sounds fun how, how long until um the Bruno book is finished or is that quite a way off uh no um actually I'm kind of irritated with myself but I I'm not further along right now I was planning on starting drafting this summer and um summer just ended up being as busy as normal semester time so I, uh, I I haven't yet started the drafts but I remain sanguine that maybe I can get it all done by the beginning of January <laughs> you know, if I vocalize that it might happen you never know mm -hmm. I can understand that well seems like a good place to finish up um, yeah Sophie Howlett thanks very much thank you <laughs>